Computing is at the heart of a lot of things we do in daily life today. Whether it is your cell phone or your TV, your laptops or your iPad, or for that matter, cloud computing and YouTube, video processing or supercomputing, code breaking, computation is at the heart of all of these things we take for granted in everyday life. At the heart of computation is the processor. And this little processor is very critical in terms of how fast you can process things, how complicated are the equations that you can solve, how fast you can process video, how fast you can download data, and so on. So traditionally, uh, this processor used to be one core or a single processor. It's as if one human being was doing the work. And over the years, in the 80s and 90s, as this processor got faster and faster, a work got done faster and faster. However, there came a time in the uh, uh, late 90s when this processor could not get to be fast enough. It's like taking a human being and making that human being stronger and stronger, giving the human being more and more vitamins, more and more muscles. And so you made one human being stronger and stronger so they could do more and more work. But there came a time when you could not make that human being stronger than they already were. We were reaching physical limits. We were reaching physical limits of energy, physical limits of power, how much heat can be dissipated. We were li uh, reaching limits of performance. So given all these limits, our field really had to think of new ways of extending the performance. So one approach to doing that is called parallel computing. And in this field, the idea is rather than having one person do the work, the analogy is you have many people do the work. And so what a number of us in the field began to do was began to use multiple processors to work together. And that's the field of multi-core processing. Not one core, but multiple cores. It's like multiple human beings doing a project. Now, just as with multiple human beings, you have other issues to deal with which are new. You have to worry about how do you coordinate multiple human beings? How do they talk to each other? If they have to share some data or some state, if one person makes a change, how does somebody else know that the change got made? If one person changes the date on something, how does another person know that the date got changed? So the same issues that you have in human beings cooperating, we saw the same issues with multiple cores or multiple processors cooperating. So that is the whole field of multi-core computer architecture. And uh, my group at MIT uh, has been doing work in this field for uh, uh, several decades, uh, since, uh, since the 80s. And uh, our group at MIT invented a technique called tiled multi-core processors. The idea was to take, or rather than build one very powerful processor, have one very powerful human being, the idea was to take many ordinary human beings, the analogy, many simple processors, and put them in the configuration of tiles. You, you build many of these simple processors and you put them in a chip in a tiled fashion, just like you would tile a floor. A floor. So now we had these tiles and every tile was identical to every other tile. Every tile contained a processor and some memory and some communications. And you could connect these tiles together and the styled multi-core concept was very powerful. And we talked about it in the uh, late 90s. The idea of this technique was that you could build one unit. And depending on how much performance you needed, you could build more and more of them uh, in a tiled fashion. It's almost like uh, computing by the yard. Uh, you could buy, it's almost like you could buy computing by the square yard and uh, in a tiled concept. So if you wanted a small performance, you cut out a two by two. You wanted a lot more performance, you built a 10 by 10 for 100 cores. And the challenge here was how do you build an architecture where many cores could uh, talk to each other effectively? And so one of the big problems we solved was interconnect. How do you connect hundreds of cores together on a single chip? And uh, so we solved the interconnect problem. Uh, On-chip interconnect, how do you uh, connect them all together and make it very effective? So that was one challenge we addressed. Second challenge was uh, uh, data sharing. If uh, one tile or a processor over here made a change to some data, 
how does somebody else, another processor over here, know that this change was made so that they could share the same data? And that problem was called uh, coherent shared memory. And we had to solve the coherent shared memory problem. How do you keep the data coherent? So we built techniques uh, to solve the coherent shared memory problem. So these are some of the challenges we addressed. And uh, at MIT, we built uh, a chip called RAW, R-A-W. And the RAW chip was the prototype that came out in 2002 that incorporated many of these concepts. We also formed a company called uh, Tylera Corporation to uh, take the research from the lab and uh, go out and make it available to the world in a commercial fashion. And so Tylera Corporation took the concept of the raw processor, of the tiled architecture, and uh, created the tile processor. So the tile processor has you know, really cool technologies to interconnect lots of tiles together. Uh, they also solve the data sharing problem. There's an I.O. problem. So the tile multicore processor solves all of these issues. And at Tylera, over the past uh, eight or nine years that uh, Tylera has been in existence, uh, Tylera has solved many other problems, including how do you make these tile multicore processors very energy efficient? How do you make green processors, green computing? How do you apply them to uh, applications like uh, deep networking or video processing and make it very efficient at streaming, uh, streaming types of computations? So uh, the tile multicore processors really took the research from MIT and advanced it to the point where you could build a very effective commercial processor that could scale from one core or two cores all the way up to hundreds of cores enabling our field of computing uh, to progress for another 10 or 20 years before we would have to think of the next big breakthrough. It's interesting to speculate about how many tiles or how many processors could a, uh, a tile multi-core processor, as an example, uh, you know, contribute to solve uh, some big problems? You know, uh, for some problems, what we discovered is uh, you can have uh, two or three processors to be used to solve it. Other problems were amenable to hundreds of cores or hundreds of tiles. So it really depended a lot on two big factors. One big factor was the problem. If a problem was inherently sequential, if, uh, for example, uh, have a number of human beings are trying to do a piece of work, and uh, the piece of work is such that fundamentally uh, the job could not be shared among two people. So for example, if the job was to write with a given pen um, a letter on a piece of paper, where the whole letter had to be really coherent from beginning to end, a sequential letter written by a given type of pen. One person can write the letter, but it's hard to imagine uh, four people cooperating to write the letter. There's only one pen, so it's, it's really hard to imagine that. So one can imagine that there's two or three paragraphs, so maybe we have three people write the three paragraphs. So, so maybe writing a letter could be parallelized among three people or four people. Similarly, in computing, certain kinds of jobs can be parallelized among four cores. But there are many other jobs that can use hundreds of cores, um, and in fact, there is virtually unlimited parallelism. And one example of that is uh, networking. So in networking, uh, for, for network security, oftentimes as you have packets flying through a network, you have to look inside a packet to see whether there is any infection in the packet. Is it, does it contain a virus? Does it contain a denial of service attack? And so packets, there are a lot of packets, and for certain kinds of threats, you can look at each packet independently. So now you could have, if you have 100 cores, you can look at 100 packets simultaneously. There's a lot of parallelism in packet processing. Similarly in video, in video, when we do encoding, now let's say, for example, we have uh, MPEG-4 or H.264 for high-definition video. The higher the definition of video, it turns out there's more pixels on the screen. And so for many vision kinds of processing, video processing, you can parallelize by the region of the video that you process by pixel. So there's a lot of process, parallel processing available in video as well. So you can use oftentimes tens or sometimes even hundreds of processors to process video. So really, the parallelism depends on the job. The second aspect of parallelism is the architecture. If your architecture is not very good, so for example, if you don't have a very good communication network, if you don't have a good interconnect, then even if the job has a lot of parallelism, you can't do well. So many traditional processors used to have a bus interconnect. In a bus, 
only one person can talk at any given time because there's a bus. What, uh, with the Tylera processors and the work that came out of MIT used a mesh interconnect. With the mesh interconnect, many processors could be talking to each other simultaneously. And so uh, the communication was not a bottleneck. So the architecture of the processor also matters in terms of how many people you can get to work together. There are many ways to fund research of this sort where people are researching how to build better, faster, more energy efficient processors. One of them that uh, certainly enabled the work that uh, my group at MIT did, at MIT uh, CSAIL, the Computer Science and AI Lab, and also the work, uh, a lot of the work at Tylera, was the Department of Defense. So DARPA, D-A-R-P-A, is an agency that funds a lot of this work. And the motivation there is defense applications. There have been applications like uh, uh, mobile radio, applications like uh, you know, satellites, um, applications like tracking and security and, and, and network security and so on, where they're looking to process a lot of signals, a lot of data. And there's a huge demand for processing power with high energy efficiency. So a lot of the funding came from DARPA, a Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. So that is one approach to funding. A second approach to funding is for the kinds of scientific problems that humankind needs to solve, for, for example, to uh, do energy research and so on. So there, a lot of the funding comes from the National Science Foundation, where the funding research to fundamentally look into basic concepts like processor design and architecture, simply because it is useful for humanity. Finally, the third is commercial funding. At Tylera, for example, the money came from venture capital. And there, the applications are consumer applications and business applications. And there, the funding comes from venture capital. And a lot of the R&D that happens there is with a clear business goal in mind. And a lot of innovation and research happened at uh, Tylera as well to look into foundational building blocks for the future. So really three classes, defense, basic science research, and finally, consumer and business applications uh, with a clear commercial view in mind. The future of uh, computing architecture and parallel computers is very exciting. I see a future maybe a decade from now or later where we can truly embrace the vision of computing by the yard, where I can build chips that are tiny or big using the identical architecture, depending on how much I need. You know, small chips, bigger chips, which are very energy efficient. Another really interesting part of that is uh, where the chips can manage themselves, where they can learn intelligently and uh, manage the energy themselves so that the more computation I run, the more energy efficient these chips become. Where I use some of the extra tiles, extra cores, to make my computation more energy efficient. So there's many exciting research opportunities in the future.